Chapter 10 A Message on Money or Money Talks and You Would Do Well to Listen It is the first duty of every man not to be poor. George Bernard Shaw I've been rich and I've been poor, and rich is better. Sophie Tucker The only thing you can learn by studying poverty is how to be poor. Michael Novak Money doesn't talk, it screams. Clara Looper Nothing man has ever invented receives so much attention, is so widely sought, and generates so much contro controversy as this small item. It is a piece of paper that measures two and five eighths by six and one eighth inches with a thickness of point zero zero four three inches. It takes four hundred and ninety of them to weigh a pound. It is both used and abused, worshipped and haggled over. Some say it liberates men. Others say that it enslaves them. People sometimes become emotional over it, especially when there is too little of it. Sooner or later, it manages to become the focal point of all activity. What is it? It's the dollar bill. The reason the subject of money almost invariably arises in a discussion of achievement is that the two are so frequently is that the two so frequently go hand in hand, not always, but often. There are, of course, some types of success that have nothing whatsoever to do with money, but there are many others in which financial rewards follow great achievements, and a promise of those rewards sometimes inspire those achievements to start with. For the ambitious, the implications of seeking and attracting large sums of money are often more than abstractions. Money or wealth is an issue about which we hear contradictory opinions, and one that we must ultimately sort out for ourselves. The purpose of this lesson is to get down to the basics, to clear the air surrounding the entire subject of money, and to explain exactly what money is and what it isn't. The desire for material gain is fundamental in human nature. Men and women have been concerned about prosperity and wealth since the first coin was fashioned in Asia Minor around 750 BC. Many have said that money is like good health. Man is concerned about it to the extent that he doesn't have it. True happiness consists not in the possession of things, but in the privilege of self-expression through the use of material things. You must have money in order to enjoy freedom of body and mind. A person cannot really be free if he is chained to the routine job most of his waking hours and receives a mere subsistence in return. If a person has to pay that much for existence, he is paying too high a price. This chapter will teach you a proven way to rid yourself of self-imposed limitations and enjoy your fill of life's riches. To begin, it is terribly important that you bury once and for all, the myth that money is bad or unimportant. Money is not, not bad. As the Bible says, the love of money is bad. In fact, money is important. It's terribly important. It's just as important as the food and clothes that it buys, the shelter it affords, the education that it provides, and the bills that it pays. Money is important to anyone living in a civilized society, and to argue that it's not important is absurd. Let anyone who imagines that he does not need money try to get along without it. Let us be realistic enough to face the facts of life, and demand from life the best that it can give. Nothing will take the place of money in the, uh, in the area in which money works. It's your right to be rich. Money is a great motivator, increasing your net worth, accumulating wealth in order to help others, and earning money for the advantages it can offer you and your family are worthwhile objectives. The availability of money frees your mind to concentrate on achieving your goals. If you know that your expenses are covered and you are relieved of the worry that comes with meeting your debts, you can devote all of your time and energy to achieving your objectives, and achieving them becomes easier. You feel relaxed and at ease. You attract others because they are attracted to you. 
There is also a peace of mind that comes with financial security that allows you to set your own agenda for your life. A healthy investment portfolio eliminates many of the what-ifs associated with money worries. You no longer haggle over unexpected expenses that could throw your business or family budget into a tailspin. You can make career and business decisions based on merit rather than expediency. And you can take a chance on an idea that has great potential if you know you are protected against disaster. A healthy cash reserve is the best protection against financial ruin. But most people, unfortunately, don't bother to build cash reserves. Perhaps one of the greatest shocks I ever received was one that I encountered when I began lecturing on success. I soon realized that many who attended my lectures were still trying to resolve the inner conflict of whether they should actually desire prosperity. Of course, they wanted prosperity. It's human nature. But they secretly questioned whether they should seek it, especially from a spiritual point of view. Surprisingly, many businessmen and women seemed to feel guilty about the whole idea of prosperity. Though they were working quite hard to become prosperous, day in and day out, in their respective professions. But the question remained in their minds, is poverty a spiritual virtue or a common vice? This discord in their thinking was creating a tug of war in their affairs, which neutralized their efforts to succeed, no matter how much work they put forth. It became apparent that it would take the expression of some bold, even shocking ideas on the subject of wealth to blast these individuals out of their confining beliefs, which had chained them to the anchor of mediocrity. That is why this chapter is so important. As highlighted earlier, it is shockingly right instead of shockingly wrong for you to be prosperous. Obviously, you cannot be very happy if you are poor, and you need not be poor. Poverty or the lack of wealth is a form of hell caused by man's ignorance of the mental laws governing prosperity. Poverty is a dirty, uncomfortable, degrading experience. It is a form of disease and in its acute phases seems to be a form of insanity. Poverty fills prisons. It drives men and women to drink, to drug addiction, and sometimes to suicide. It can lead potentially fine, talented, intelligent children to delinquency and crime. It can make people do things they otherwise would never dream of doing. Be done with the thinking of poverty as a virtue. It is a common vice. If you've been living in this hell on earth, you've literally been blinded to the abundance that lies at your feet. This is the shocking truth about poverty. What I learned from America's most successful black entrepreneurs. Nearly five years ago, as a part of my graduation requirements for a doctoral degree, I found myself in the unenviable position during my oral examination of trying to convince a group of seemingly unconvincible scholars as to my command of the causes of wealth and poverty among third world nations. Halfway through the grueling ordeal, one of my committee members asked, how does a nation choke with poverty reverse its course and create wealth? In my anxiety to answer his question and gain the committee's approval, I cited various reasons why a country would experience poverty or prosperity. I quoted reams of government statistics culled from numerous sources that were surefire anecdotes of growth and stagnation. A deafening silence elapsed before this body of scholars confronted me with another barrage of questions. Though I was eventually awarded a doctorate, that same question continued to surface. How does a nation prosper? Or better yet, how does an entire race or an individual create success? An idea began to take hold. For the next five years, my focus dramatically shifted. I sought out individuals who could provide answers to my probing questions. High achieving black men and women who had asked these questions themselves. As a result, I combed the nation interviewing su successful black business people from John H. Johnson of Johnson Publications and Earl Graves of Black Enterprise Magazine to fight promoter Don King and computer entrepreneur Alicia Page, 35 in all and at the personal 
expense of $25,000. It was in this laboratory that I saw for myself the qualities and characteristics that are peculiar to economic advancement. Armed with a three-page questionnaire, I observed these giants up close, charting their every move. From this research, I identified principles that reveal two separate paths, one to prosperity and the other to poverty. Man has been taught that wealth is basically material and therefore ultimately finite. The cornerstone of this thinking is the philosophy that there are only two ways to promote equality in terms of wealth. You either make the rich poor or the poor rich. This illusion is shared by countless Americans. Their general idea centers on life as a zero-sum game, that one's gain comes at the expense of another's loss. According to this view, there are only so many jobs to go around, only so much energy to be used, and only so much opportunity to be taken advantage of. A fixed amount of prosperity and a fixed amount of poverty, and it is the luck of the draw as to who will prosper or hunger. Throughout the ages, mankind has been afflicted with such limited thinking and its adherence. But this misconstrues wealth's true nature. Wealth is neither physical nor limited. Wealth takes on contrasting forms, vision, discipline, work, faith, initiative, resilience, desire, ideas, and thought, all unlimited and infinite. Wealth is embodied in a web of enterprise that retains its worth only through constant work, sacrifice, and service. Oftentimes, it comes from doing what others consider insuffer insufferably boring. Wealth's most salient characteristic is that it's available to all and is primarily metaphysical, not physical. Consequently, the creation of wealth lies within you, the individual. Government cannot provide the answer. No government or institution could ever produce a Barbara Proctor, John Johnson, or Don King. Why? Because the precepts of wealth run contrary to the very nature of bureaucracies. Wealth develops within the individual. Under a capitalist or open society, wealth is less a stock of goods than a flow of ideas. Wealth comes from a consciousness that unfolds within. In practical terms, wealth is a characteristic of thought. Man's foremost quality is his rational faculty. The skills of living successfully are acquired through knowledge. Knowledge is available to each of us and when properly applied is power. The antithesis of knowledge is ignorance. Our degree of ignorance will determine our place in society. Though each of us is born ignorant and must for a time live in ignorance, those who remain ignorant have only themselves to blame. Since knowledge, thinking, and rational action are human qualities, and since the choice to exercise this faculty rests with each of us, society's survival requires that those who think be free to do so without interference from those who don't. If some men choose not to think, they can survive only by imitating and repeating a routine line of work contrived by more resourceful men. Every man or woman is free to rise as far as he or she is able or willing, but it's only the degree to which he or she thinks that will determine the degree to which he or she will rise. Wealth always starts in the mind with a prosperity consciousness. Until mankind reorients its thinking about wealth's true nature, the wreckage of the ghetto and unnecessary failures will continue to mount. The key to any condition of lack is mental principle. Poverty is not corrected by a redistribution of wealth, but by ideas. You can give a man begging for coffee or food a dollar, but before that day is out he will be hungry again. Unless there is a change in consciousness, unless all parties awaken to wealth's true nature, and get in tune with the infinite supply of ideas, nothing will change. As I pen these thoughts, my mind drifts back to the words of Wally Amos, shared with me several years ago. Wally succinctly expressed a great deal of wisdom when he stated, in order to overcome poverty, one needs only to raise his level of vision. The cure for lack of any type is found within a change of thinking. 
What is money? Money is a warm home and healthy children. It's birthday presents and a college education. It's a family vacation and the means to help the less fortunate. Money is the harvest of our giving. It is what we receive for our production and services. And in turn, it can be used to obtain the production and services of others. Quite often, we can accurately gauge the extent of our production and services by counting the money we receive for our efforts. In this respect, money is a yardstick, a rule or standard that is completely negotiable and can be used by each of us. You'll hear people say, money won't bring happiness, but the earning and possession of money has brought much more happiness than has poverty. Money is an extension of you, your thinking. It is a symbol of either limitation or limitlessness, limitlessness according to your thoughts. If you think favorably about money, it increases in your midst. But if you criticize or condemn it, it will dissipate as you approach it. The good news is that regardless of our present circumstances, each of us can change or alter our thinking to coax wealth into our lives. Black America, you are already rich. To nine-tenths of the world's population, the average black American is already rich. There is a larger gap between the standard of living of most of the world's population and the average black worker than there is between the standard enjoyed by America's average black worker and the wealthiest member of our society. In case you have fallen for the nonsense that blacks are poor, consider this not so well known fact. Black Americans earn $350 billion in annual income, estimated at 900 billion by the year 2000 and spends 225 billion dollars a year on goods and services. This dollar figure is equivalent to the gross national product of Canada or Australia, two of the 10 largest nations in the free world. Black America's problem is not a lack of money. Its problems stem from what it does with the money it has. Black Americans possess just about everything the wealthy possess, only in smaller amounts. They have homes, cars, stereos, television, savings accounts, and debts, only in smaller quantities. Their food is just as tasty and as plentiful. Their beds are just as comfortable, and their homes are just as cozy. They have exactly the same amount of time and just as much freedom. With only a fraction of the world's population, American blacks possess 10% of the free world's total monetary income. Or to draw a clearer picture, black America's combined income is slightly greater than that of Western Europe and greater than that of Israel or South Africa. As a people, black America is already rich. Now, how, do, how much do you want? How much money do you need to live the way you want to live, to accomplish the goals you've set for yourself? Most people think they need more money than they really do, and they settle for a lot less than they could earn. The world will pay you exactly what you bargain for, exactly what you earn, but not a penny more. That old dictum is true. I bargained with life for a penny, and life would pay no more. You will receive not what you idly wish for, but what you justly earn. Your rewards will always be in exact proportion to your service. If you are unhappy with your income, you must devise ways and means of increasing your service. How may I serve? Economic security is not attained by the possession of money alone. It is captured by the service one renders. Useful service may be converted into all forms of human needs, with or without the use of money. A successful businessman has economic security, not because he controls vast amounts of money, but for the better reason that he provides profitable employment for men and women, and through them provides goods and services of great value to countless others. The service he renders attracts the money he controls, and it is in this manner that all enduring economic security must be obtained. Your service must come from you, your mind, your ability, your talent, and your energy. 
A strong individual cannot make a weak person strong, but a weak man or woman can become strong through his or her volition by following a specific course of action. And one who is already strong can become much stronger. Put in metaphorical terms, a diamond is more valuable than a lump of coal, yet that's exactly what a diamond was at one time. And just as a lump of coal can be transformed into one of the world's most valuable gems, a human being can vastly increase his or her own value to the world. To paraphrase Earl Nightingale, who had a knack for graphically verbalizing a point, the amount of money you receive will always be in direct proportion to the demand for what you do, your ability to do it, and the difficulty of replacing you. One who is highly trained is worth more money in our economy than a person who is low skilled and who can't easily be replaced. This is not to say that one person is any better or more important than anyone else. <clears throat> Remember, this lesson centers on money, nothing else. A janitor is just as important a human being as a brain surgeon, but the amount of money each will earn will be proportional to the man for what they do, the ability to do what they do, and the difficulty of replacing them. Anyone can be trained to clean and maintain a building in a few days, and replacing this person is not difficult. A brain surgeon, however, spends many years learning his profession, often at great personal sacrifice and cost, and he cannot easily be replaced. As a result, the surgeon might earn as much money in an hour as a janitor might earn in a month. Now these are extreme cases used only to show the relationship of income to demand, skill, and supply. And this is as it should be. This is why there are few limitations on a person within his or her company or occupation. Your income will be in exact proportion to the demand for what you do, the ability to do what you do, and the difficulty of replacing you. This this proposition also explains why the whole notion of trying to receive something for nothing is absurd and is based on sheer delusion. A star athlete, for example, may earn millions over the course of a career. You might say shooting a basketball or lugging a football 100 yards serves no useful purpose, but the demand is there, useful or not. It's the same with celebrity status. A Hollywood starlet's income will very accurately reflect the demand for what she does. If more people understood this line of thinking, they would see why preparing for a career is crucial. Luck has been defined as what happens when preparedness meets opportunity. A great opportunity will only make the unprepared, the unqualified look foolish. Now how do you measure up? While this may sound elementary, you would be amazed at the number of people who desire material riches, but who do not take the time and trouble to qualify for them. And until they qualify for them, there is little chance for them to earn them. It's like the farmer who stood in front of the fireplace trying to get warm. He soon realized, however, that until he gathered wood and started a fire, he would freeze. Parents, do not shield your children from serving. It has been said, and with reason, that a rich man's son often does not display the qualities of his father. Many children of affluent means are robbed of important traits because they inherited their parents' wealth. By and large, the father or mother worked for every penny he or she earned. The father's earnings came to him side by side with the development of his insight, his talents, and his abilities. He was not given riches by his father. He was given riches by his service. Now let us look at his son. All his life, his son has lived in the midst of luxury and the many comforts that money provides. The son knows he is going to share and eventually acquire great amounts of wealth that he has not earned. Assuming that his son does have the inherent willingness to serve, what happens to that willingness? In many cases, it is replaced by a desire to obtain something for nothing, and thus he never learns one of life's basic lessons, the practice of service first and profits second. 
Great fortunes or comfortable means are a blessing only when they are used to benefit others. No father benefits his son when he robs him of initiative. If you wish to shield, to shield your children from the bad parts of life, you are to be praised. But beyond that, do not shield them from their ability to serve, for this is true wealth. Allow them to have the priceless opportunity of building better lives with their own self-taught wisdom and lessons. Peace of mind is wealth. Napoleon Hill tells a fascinating story of his visit with John D. Rockefeller, Sr., oil magnate. During their meeting, Rockefeller, easily the world's richest man at the time, asked the young reporter if he would like to change places with him. Without hesitation, Hill politely told him that he would not, and that he valued his health and freedom, neither of which Rockefeller, for all of his opulence, had or enjoyed. Many years later, after his death, Hill reflected on that eventful meeting. What did Rockefeller really want, Hill questioned. By consulting with those he knew, who knew him, Hill firmly believed that the multimillionaire wanted nothing more than what he had missed in his tremendous money-making career, peace of mind. Peace of mind is an essential ingredient of prosperity and covers a surprisingly broad field. In every way you use it, peace of mind aids you in your quest for riches, both material and spiritual, and success. Peace of mind helps you live your life on your own terms, in values of your own choosing, so that every day your life grows richer and greater. Is there a connection between wealth and peace of mind? Maybe. There certainly are poor people who have peace of mind, but not as many as we are taught to believe. You need not be a millionaire or even financially independent. But without sufficient money, you are cut off from much in life that sustains the spirit. If you are continually worrying about feeding your family or keeping a roof over your head, you will have no peace of mind. Money brings the finer things of life and many times the bare necessities. While it is no surprise that many wealthy people enjoy peace of mind, there are members of this touted class who do not. If the main purpose of wealth is to make its possessor worry about keeping his fortune, peace of mind will forever elude him. One of my favorite real life stories that illustrate the power of peace of mind and how it can be used to benefit the spirit is the experience of Oprah Winfrey. My life is at peace. Oprah Winfrey has become one of America's most watched television talk show hosts, as well as a promising actress. She was honored for her 1985 screen debut in The Color Purple, with nominations from both the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences and the Golden Globe Awards. In 1987, the syndicated Oprah Winfrey show won an Emmy Award for television's best talk show, and Oprah received an Emmy for Best Talk Show Host. In 1986, she formed her own production company, Harpo Productions, which has already become a major creative force in the entertainment industry. In 1990, deals for made-for-TV movies and licensing fees from her talk show have netted her nearly $40 million in revenues, making her the wealthiest black woman in America. To say that Oprah Winfrey lives life to its fullest while radiating an inner harmony would be a gross understatement, for she is a woman at peace with herself, her life, and world. That there was a tense period in Oprah's life when she sought inner solitude but couldn't find it. Instead, the sheltered little girl from a small southern town found a troubled world. Oprah Winfrey was born on a farm in Kosciuszko, Mississippi. Her unwed parents had intended to name her Orpa after Ruth's sister-in-law in the Bible, but a midwife transposed the letters on the birth certificate and she was named Oprah instead. Soon after her birth, her parents separated. She would be nearly six years old before she would know her father. Raised under her grandmother's protective wing, Oprah was a precociously bookish child. 
She learned to read at three years of age. When she enrolled in kindergarten, she intuitively wrote a note that pointed out in no uncertain terms that she belonged in first grade. An astonished teacher recognized her ability and had her promoted. After completing the academic year, Oprah skipped directly to the third grade. At age six, she was sent north to Milwaukee to join her mother and two half-brothers. Her mother had since found a marginal existence trying to make ends meet by supplementing a $50 a month domestic salary with whatever welfare was available. Deprived of the wide open farm life of Mississippi and her grandmother's love, Oprah turned inward. Acts of sexual abuse by a series of trusted men violated her innocence, first by an older male relative and later by a friend. Each incident left her guilty, confused, and afraid to report the offense. Lashing out at the world, she constantly rebelled. She began staging dramatic, if minor, acts of delinquency. Trying to escape an abusive environment, Oprah ran away several times, only to be caught and returned home. When she was 13, her beleaguered and distraught mother dragged her to a detention center that was already full. With few options left, her mother decided to turn her over to her father. Vernon Winfrey had found a better life in Nashville, Tennessee as a barber, businessman, and community leader. Living with her father and stepmother gave Oprah protection and security while reaffirming her grandmother's early teachings in excellence and pride. Oprah's father was a strict disciplinarian who provided his daughter with guidance, late night discussions, and books. Privileges were withheld unless she could add new words to an already expanding vocabulary. But he didn't stop here. He demanded weekly book reports, combing each report for correct grammar usage and proper sentence structure. Under his stern regimen, the once rebellious child began to excel both in and out of the classroom. With renewed vigor, Oprah made two solemn promises. First, she would begin to apply herself fully and take total responsibility for her life. Second, she would close the door to her troubled past and reconstruct her life on the solid foundation of divine guidance. Adhering to both promises, she set her mind at ease. The child who learned to read and who had made her first speech in church at age three found outlets for her talents. In high school, she presided over the student council, joined the drama club, and distinguished herself as a public speaker. When she was 16, she won an oratorical contest that awarded a scholarship to Tennessee State University. A year later, she was invited to the White House with other young achievers. During her freshman year at Tennessee State, Oprah continued to blossom. She entered and won the Miss Black Nashville contest. Later, she captured the title of Miss Tennessee. In 1971, she ran for Miss Black America and sought a career in broadcasting. To her surprise, she was hired as a reporter while still at Tennessee State, first by a local radio station and later by a CBS affiliate. By 1976, she was working in Baltimore for ABC TV as a feature reporter and co-anchor of that city's 6 o'clock news. But suddenly, Oprah started having trouble at work. As a reporter and co-anchor, she found that she had, no, she had to fight back tears when covering stories that tugged at her heart. In fact, the station manager threatened to discharge her if she failed to question a distraught woman at the scene of a fire in which the woman had lost her family. Reluctantly, Oprah complied, but apologized later during a live news broadcast. Her difficulties at work were compounded when the same station manager altered her reporting style and format. They tried to make me into something I wasn't, Oprah remembers. This left her self-esteem battered and her career sidetracked. Hoping to steer her in a new direction, the news director moved her to the station's morning talk show. Though viewed by many as a demotion, the move was a blessing in disguise. After her first day in the new slot, she exclaimed, This is what I was born to do. This is like breathing. The once lackluster show's ratings rocketed. Within five months, it was the third highest rated show in syndication. 
and the number one talk show in Baltimore. Based on that performance, Oprah was offered the whole slot of WLS-TV's AM Chicago show in 1984. The rest is much publicized history. For eight years, Oprah Winfrey was tackled, has tackled nearly every topic under the sun. By 1986, she had reached true celebrity status as daytime TV's reigning queen, worth an estimated $40 million. Many have called her lucky, and because of her instant success, some say she is a financial genius. But whatever the reasons for her accomplishments, peace of mind certainly plays a part. Life is quite simple, she confesses, so simple that most people miss the point entirely. They either think I'm lucky or I get all the breaks. The truth of the matter is that I am spirit-led. My life is actually better than it appears because of my inner peace. I used to be my own worst enemy, but that has changed. If you allow yourself to get out of the way, grace will come to you. I share this story with you because your goal in life, presumably, presumably is to achieve success. Oprah Winfrey's logic is so simple, everyone can understand her message. Her message is clear. To be successful, regardless of personal wealth, you must find peace of mind. Oprah Winfrey found peace and harmony through daily spiritual guidance. Your methods may differ, but regardless of the source of your power, you must find and maintain inner tranquility. Why? Because those who work for money alone and those who receive nothing but money for their efforts are always underpaid, no matter how much they receive. No amount of money could possibly take the place of peace of mind. To get more out of life, you must first give more. She gives back more than she receives. Wealth comes to the individual who sees a potential for wealth. As previously noted, you cannot carry others along the highway of success, but you may point the way by helping others to help themselves. A large sum of money in the hands of a man or woman generally does not create as much prosperity as does capital that circulates, provided those who handle its circulation are interested in creating wealth. The virtue of money consists in its utility, not its quantity. Although Oprah's lifestyle in some ways fits her financial status, a splendidly decorated home, jet-set travel, and a bejeweled and fashionable wardrobe, in some ways it doesn't. More often than not, Oprah seems quite unaffected by her success. Many times she is equally as comfortable simply relaxing at home with a good book. There's more to her agenda than building a business, making movies, or generating additional income. She wants to make a positive change in people's lives. Philanthropy is an important responsibility. There is always the possibility that a financial gift to an institution or individual can do more, can do more harm than good. Misplaced intentions have people dependent upon something for nothing robbing them of their dignity and any opportunity to develop their best potential. But Oprah knows better. For example, she gave four-year scholarships to 10 students attending her alma mater. She selected the winners from a list of incoming first-year students, assessing their needs and scholastic abilities. The scholarships included tuition, room and board, books, even spending money. But like all good stewards, Oprah placed a condition on her philanthropy. She required each student to maintain at least a B average. When her scholars were about to begin their sophomore year, two of her students let their grades slip. As a result, she sent each of them a letter that said in part, I understand that the first year is really difficult and that there were a lot of adjustments to be made. I believe in you. We all made an agreement that it would be a 3-point B average, not a 2.9. I know you want to uphold your end of the agreement because I intend to uphold mine. By requiring her scholars to adhere to the letter of the agreement, Oprah has transferred principles such as responsibility, persistence, and self-discipline that are far more valuable than any material riches. These qualities play key roles that will lead to peace of mind.
Can you increase your wealth without achieving happiness or peace of mind or by sharing your happiness and riches? Yes, of course you can. But whatever you will enjoy, but whether you will enjoy the fruits of your efforts remain to be seen. Service, as you will see, is another matter. We are here to serve others. The greatest idea in the world is the opportunity to be of service to others. There is an entire world crying for help, for ideas, for endless products and services. The extent of your opportunity to be of service is often the, the extent of your imagination coupled with knowledge. And the best place to begin is where you stand. There is much to be said for the old cliche, service with a smile. If your attitude is positive and you go the extra mile giving added services over and above that which is required, then you are well on your way to rich and worthwhile relationships. The habit of giving more and better service brings rewards in many forms, both in the heart and in the pocketbook. Bread cast upon the water will return to sustain and strengthen the man who is rendering more service and better service than he is paid or expected to do. Lee Dunham has served all his life. As a young boy reared in Canapolis, North Carolina, the son of sharecroppers, Lee balanced his time between chopping cotton and raising hogs. After school, he hustled, shining shoes at his own shoe stand, selling newspapers, and delivering groceries. My parents pointed out the value of work, Dunham said. I was taught at an early age that everyone has the ability to serve, and by serving others, I could be successful. In 1951, Dunham joined the Air Force and was immediately sent to his food service school. There he sharpened skills that he would use in later years. Dunham became such a proficient cook that he was soon transferred from the enlisted men's mess to the officer's dining hall. He left the military after a four-year commitment and worked in a number of restaurants, among them the dining room of the plush Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York. Two years later, he decided to serve in a different capacity and joined the city's police force. Dunham was a policeman for 15 years before a chronic back ailment forced him into early retirement. Regardless of the beat or the assignment, he thoroughly enjoyed his work. If I had to do it all over again, he says with sincerity, I would still be a cop. There was something about public service that attracted me. Working on the force was the greatest thing in my life, but Dunham knew the food business equally as well and had similar feelings. Deep inside, a dream gnawed away. He hoped to open a family restaurant in the heart of New York, catering to a select clientele. In pursuit of his dream, Dunham had expected financial help from a number of sources created to support minority enterprises, but he and these agencies haggled over the specifics and several deals fell through. Left with no other immediate sources of financing, Dunham turned to the fin franchising. Dunham turned to franchising instead. In 1971, he queried a few companies, among them Kentucky Fried Chicken, Holiday Inn, Chicken Delight, and McDonald's, about business opportunities. McDonald's was the first to write back, inviting him to an interview at its Boston office. The chain told him he would need nearly $200,000 to purchase an outlet and proposed a location in inner city New York, the first of its type. Understandably, Dunham was hesitant. Through the, through, though he was anxious to get started, McDonald's had absolutely no experience marketing hamburgers in the black community. The last thing he wanted was to be a guinea pig. After many sleepless nights, Dunham blasted forward, investing his life savings, $35,000, and borrowing the balance from a bank. He became one of only a handful of black owner operators nationwide and the only operator with an outlet in the inner city. 
The odds against his success were frightening. His family and friends questioned his judgment, and even he had moments of doubt. But in his mind, he had a plan that would eventually ensure his success. Lee teaches other, others what he already knew. When Lee Dunham opened his McDonald's franchise in March 1972 on Harlem's main thoroughfare, the soft smile on his face slowly faded. The fast deteriorating neighborhood was rampant with crime. His first three months in business resembled a chronicle of war as he faced violent confrontations almost every day. Fights were far too frequent. Guns were fired on occasion and the mere presence of jacketed gang members drove customers away. The safe in Dunham's corner office was routinely, routinely blown open. Furthermore, he lost whatever profits he made as employees stole food and other supplies as well as money from the registers. Normally, field agents from the McDonald's home office would visit new franchisees to help with management problems, but in Dunham's case, representatives were too apprehensive to go into the inner city. Dunham would have to solve his problems himself. He also knew he had to make his intentions of succeeding on Harlem's 125th Street crystal clear to the area's thugs and stick-up men. Nearing the end of his rope, he had to develop a plan, and fast. My experience as a cop was just as important to my success as the training I received in the home office. Without it, the criminal element would have run me out in one week. Refusing to back down, Dunham made significant changes. He viewed the shambles of the neighborhood and the wrecked human lives. He saw the need for someone to inspire and offer positive solutions. He saw the need to serve. Dunham spoke openly and honestly with gang leaders, helping them find more useful ways to channel their energies. He sponsored athletic teams, awarded scholarships, and employed gang members, teaching them the principles of discipline, responsibility, and the value of service. He began spot checks on all cashiers and fired anyone caught stealing. He improved working conditions and gave time off to full-time employees. Dunham told anyone who would listen in no-nonsense terms that his store offered a way out of the life of confinement, offered hope and opportunity, and that he would do anything to keep it, even if that meant meeting force with force. But most important, after thorough and careful review, he developed faster and more efficient methods to serve the customer. Dunham examined and timed the entire ordering process, searching for flaws. He surveyed customers and asked for their input. He stressed the basics, quality, service, cleanliness, and value, and required each employee to give his or her personal best and go the extra mile to satisfy customer needs. The tactics worked. By the end of the first year, his investment began to pay off as profits soared. This McDonald's franchise, with the questionable location, began attracting 3,500 people, eat, people each week and 5,000 on the weekends. Because of his phenomenal success, McDonald's offered Dunham a second store, which he opened a year later. Word quickly spread as Lee Dunham and his employees began to collect company awards and honors. The Harlem operation became McDonald's most profitable franchise worldwide, earning more than 1.5 million a year. Company officials flocked to the New York unit to uncover Dunham's winning secret. What is his secret? A modest man, Dunham attributes much of his success to his employees and to the one key principle that he learned as a child. Every Tuesday evening at his company's New York headquarters and at his own expense, he unveils his secret in a management development course that he teaches to employees. Kill them with service, he says with simplicity. All of us can serve. We can give faster service, cheaper service, and go the extra mile. Serving others is the reason for our business, not an intrusion on our business. Dunham pauses and further explains the secret that put him over the top. The underpinnings of prosperity have been studied and analyzed. Unequivocally, growth and profits are a byproduct of service. Everyone must be his own salesman of personal services. You must give your very best and commit yourself to excellence. 
you must give customers more than what they expect. There is something infinitely better than making a living, and that's making a contribution. Dunham is adamant about making a contribution and serving his community. When asked to define success, he advises, you just can't take, you must give something back. I'm not in business just to make money. The greatest service that I can render is to motivate our youth. Through his success philosophy, Dunham has seen young men and women change the course of their lives for the better. Today, Lee Dunham is the owner-operator of eight McDonald's franchises that employ 520 workers, mostly black teens, and generate more than $14 million a year. Read and reread the above story. Give, give your best. Work at making your service better. And give more than is expected with the right attitude. Do what you do so well that you'll always guarantee you're receiving a larger share of any available business. Human beings have wants and needs, and it is by meeting these wants and needs that we serve others. Albert Einstein embodied the idealism of service when he was asked, Why are we here? To which he replied, We are here to serve others. Lee Dunham is correct. We all have the ability to serve, and if we don't serve, we don't reap a harvest. The extent of our sowing will determine the size of our harvest and our action and reaction. Millions have misunderstood this principle, thereby forcing themselves into a quandary. You've heard people say, so-and-so worked hard every day of his life and has nothing to show for it. If this is true, this person has made some serious mistakes. In reality, he should have been quite well to do by now. He was either in the wrong field or failed to seize the opportunities around him. We see millions who are starving in Africa, and the world responds by sending money and donations. The drought, the closed inefficient governments, the lack of freedom and education all contribute to the inability of these people to serve. Because they are unable to serve, they receive nothing in return. Lee Dunham receives hundreds of letters each week from people asking for a portion of his wealth. Yet few of these poor ignorant souls understand that Dunham's real wealth is not measured by the dollars in his bank account or by the franchises he owns, but by the reputation and satisfaction he has gained through rendering the best possible service. Service is the rent you pay. Can you gain such a reputation? Certainly not by offering as little service as possible. Service is the rent you pay for the space you occupy while on this earth. You'll never get rich except by enriching the lives of others. And you'll never prosper except by bringing prosperity to your fellow man. An ancient parable illustrates this point. Many years ago in a kingdom far away lived a man whose official title was server of the kingdom. One day as he was walking through the forest, he was approached by a genie, and like all genies, this one offered to grant the young man a wish. Any wish? He, he exclaimed. Anything, replied the genie. The young man pondered his good fortune for a moment, then told the genie how all of his life he had served others. I know what I want, the man blurted out. I want people to serve me for a change. The genie said, granted, and vanished into the forest. Eager to test his newfound power, the young man walked back to the castle. As he approached the gate of the royal palace, a servant presented himself and opened the gate for him. That night after he finished his dinner, a servant stepped forward to wipe his mouth and clear his table. When the young man retired for the evening, a servant appeared to pull back his bed. The next morning he was greeted by another servant, who retrieved his slippers and prepared a royal breakfast. Though he valiantly tried to perform his duties as the king's cup bearer, somebody was always there to perform the chore for him. Throughout his life, all he had ever done was serve others. It wasn't long before he realized that he couldn't do anything for anyone, and he began to feel its effect. For the first 30 days, the novelty of his fortune was interesting. For the next 30 days, it was irritating. And by the last 30 days, he couldn't stand it any longer. With a thundering fury, he looked diligently for the genie. 
After a three-day search, he found him in the forest. Reduced to tears, the young man told Jeannie, I am so glad I found you. I've changed my mind. I want to go back to serving others. Without any emotion, the genie said, I can't help you. The young man reiterated, you don't understand. I am willing to do anything to dedicate my life to my fellow man. Again, the genie stated, there's nothing I can do. But the king's servant wouldn't quit. He pleaded, kind sir, I would rather be in hell than not be able to serve my fellow man. And to this, the genie replied, my dear man, where do you think you've been for the past 90 days? You have the greatest vehicle for service in America. In our country, you no longer sell a product, you render a service. The greatest thing in the world is the opportunity to be of service to others. The customer wants the most for the least amount of money and will decide where he will spend his earnings. There is a world yearning for new ideas, products, and services. How can you be of service? How best can you serve? Joseph, Joseph Carbo, the author of The Lazy Man's Way to Riches, was found fond of saying that most people are too busy earning a living to make any money. What Carbo meant was that the average person never seems to find the time to work on the really important things, the creative projects that produce big payoffs. It is creativity more so than hard work that lies at the heart of success in any field or endeavor. And in order for a person to have the time to engage in creative thinking, he must learn to work efficiently. Refer back to lesson two. Remember, all you need is one good idea. How, many, how much money do you want to earn? Take a few moments and answer the following questions. What have you got to sell? What will the world offer for what you do? How many people do you want? How many people do what you do? And in the field in which you serve, where do you stand in its hierarchy of value? Not as a human being, but as one who serves others. As you answer these questions, you might realize why some people earn more money than others. They have made themselves themselves more valuable as servers of others more in demand. People who are unwilling to do more than they're paid for will seldom be paid more for more than they're doing. You may have heard someone say, why should I knock myself out for the money I'm making? It is this attitude more than anything else that keeps men and women at the bottom of the economic pile. They have yet to understand the correlation between value and income. As you grow in value as a person, you will receive the income you seek. If you try to stand still in life, and millions do, you will never know the rewards or the joy of accomplishment, the personal satisfaction and peace of mind that comes only to the person who strives to achieve. There are two steps that you must take. First, you must decide how much money you really want, not a vague figure, but the exact amount. Second, you must release your preoccupation with the money and concentrate on improving what you now do. Improve your service, expand your service, and most important, go the extra mile. This is the format by which you will qualify yourself for the amount of money that you expect to earn. Once you have rendered adequate service for the amount of money you've decided upon, you'll soon find yourself earning it. In addition, you'll also discover that with your new forces and abilities, your tasks are no more difficult, perhaps even less difficult, than what you have been doing for the money that you are currently earning. Now ask yourself, how much money am I willing to earn? There are really three amounts you should decide upon. First, a yearly income you wish to earn now or in the future. Second, the amount of money you wish to have saved in the near future and third the amount of money you would like to have as retirement income whether you retire from active work or not write down these three amounts most people stumble at this point they never decide on any of these three amounts if you will answer these questions honestly and review what you've written periodically you will have automatically placed yourself in the top five percent of wage earners 
as discussed in the third chapter. You will have a plan and a blueprint for your future financial success. You will know where you are going and if you are determined, you most assuredly reach your objective. How one man rose to the top. Whoever you are, regardless of race, age, or education, you can increase the amount of money you earn. After reading such a statement, you may think of me as brash and off base. However, to earn all that you wish is possible. How? The key is provided in the following illustration. A. Barry Rand, president of the marketing division of Xerox, makes an imposing presence as he strides through the company boardroom. He's on the job promptly at 6 a.m. Like clockwork, dozens of senior executives assemble for strategy, strategy sessions as Team Xerox begins to unfold. Begins to unfold. Within the next hour, Rand will conduct sales meetings in his spacious office, return to the boardroom for a critical conference with a market research group, and catch a corporate jet to go to a meeting about mapping future strategies. While commuting to the airport, he dictates letters and memos on his car phone to his secretary. When his day is finally winds down, he describes it as routine. Rand does not take a matter-of-fact approach to his position as president of Xerox $5 billion operation, charged with setting the strategic direction of the organization's marketing efforts. Rand is responsible for a workforce of 33,000 that handles direct sales and service of Xerox products and systems. In a very real sense, the future of this multi-billion dollar corporation rests on his hands. How did this black man assume such a position of authority? His story should prove, should provide some insights. Barry Rand hails from a middle class family where achievement was the order of the day. Both parents are college graduates and he inevitably grew up in an environment of high expectations. His parents hoped their son would pursue a career in medicine but having wet his appetite with a part-time sales job while still in high school, he switched majors in college from pre-med to marketing. I was convinced, says Rand, that sales offered me the best opportunities. I felt that I could literally sell anything to anybody. Rand joined Xerox in 1968 as its first black sales trainee in the Washington, D.C. area. By 1970, he earned the title of Regional Sales Representative of the Year and placed among the top three sales representatives in the nation. For his efforts, he was given special recognition. Unknowingly, this would be his first lesson on the importance of establishing clear financial goals. With great anticipation, I took my award home, beaming from ear to ear. I shared my good fortune with my dad. He took one look at the plaque and shook his head. Son, he said, that's a nice prize for your efforts, but where's the money? I stood in front of him dazed by his question. Don't ever let anybody fool you again. The reality of his words struck like a bolt of lightning. I immediately began to set specific career and income goals. Though it was a painstaking process, I knew this would be the only way I could plan my life. I fastidiously recorded the dates in which I would reach the first level of sales management. Moreover, I developed a timetable in which I would return to school to complete an MBA degree. Finally, I recorded my income goals with a specific time frame for achievement, all to be accomplished by my 30th birthday. Mind you, these were not wishes or pipe dreams, but goals that I reviewed each day. I was aware that my income was directly linked to my area of responsibility and service to the organization. With clearly defined goals, Rand rapidly progressed up the corporate ladder. From corporate director in 1980 to vice president of Eastern Operations in 1984 to his current position as marketing president in 1986. Inch by inch, Barry Rand stalked his goals as promotions, pay raises, and recognition followed according to plan. You too can benefit from the lesson that Barry Rand learned. The sad fact is that 95% of all workers have no 
major purpose other than working for daily wage. The overwhelming majority will never decide upon specific planned financial goals. Therefore, no matter how much work they perform or what effort they put, they will never eke out more than a bare living. They neither expect nor demand more. But the man of affluence and success demands riches in definite terms. He has specific he has a specific plan that he carries out, giving useful service equivalent in value to the wealth he demands. Life pays the successful man on his own terms and equally compensates the man who asks for nothing more than daily wages. The wheel of fortune reacts to the mental blueprints each man sets up in his mind and brings him in physical or financial form the exact equivalent of that blueprint. Attitudes towards money. There are two attitudes toward money. There's the attitude held by the majority who trim their wants and desires to fit their incomes. And there's the attitude held by the minority, free spirits who make their incomes fit their wants. Which of these attitudes represent your present thinking? When you write down the yearly income you plan to earn, you undoubtedly know whether or not it's average for you to present. It's average for your present line of work. Chances are that the figure you decide upon will be above average. Ask yourself, who in my line of work is now earning this amount of money? If you know, you'll have a clear idea of what you'll have to do in order to earn it. It is through this process that men and women of average abilities advance through the ranks into positions of prominence, positions with corresponding incomes. Regardless of your field, your business needs new leaders. It needs men and women to keep the industry expanding. It needs new servers. Many of today's top black executives were once accountants, shipping clerks, struggling lawyers, service station attendants, salespeople, mailroom clerks, and mechanics. There isn't a position from which men and women have not climbed to the top. If you understand what I am about to say, you will attain the riches you desire. It's not the position, it's the person. It's not your present circumstances that count, but the circumstances you create that are important. The only limit on your income is you, and the income you decide upon can be achieved within the framework of your present work, industry, or profession, where you already have a start and a place. All that is needed is a plan, a roadmap, and the courage to press on to your destination. You must know in advance that there will be disappointments and setbacks, but you must also know that nothing on earth can stand in the way of a well thought out plan backed by persistence and determination. With your income goal firmly planted in your subconscious, spend a part of each day thinking of ways in which you can increase your service. Know that you have only to manage this and the income will take care of itself. Since the money you want to earn is more than you're now receiving, you should try to find ways of increasing your service until the gap has been bridged. Look at your card or paper with the three amounts written on it. By setting a financial goal, you're demonstrating faith. You'll find that you will begin to become what others call lucky. You'll begin to get good ideas and you'll take far more interest in your work and your company. You'll see opportunities that until now have been unnoticed. In fact, you'll soon discover that you're no longer the same person. Be realistic about your financial goals. Trying to jump too far too soon can often result in confusion, tension, and worry. Take your growth in sensible, logical steps, remembering that the main idea is that you know what you want and that you realize your rewards will match your service. Reflect on the mental laws, cause and effect, that control our universe. The cause must precede the effect, or the effect cannot occur. You can have whatever you desire. You need only make up your mind. Have faith in yourself and the quiet, firm, inner no knowledge that you can and will accomplish your goals. Know that the answer you seek will come to you in their own time if only you keep searching for them. 
Above all, realize that money cannot be directly sought. Money, like happiness, is an effect. It is the result of a cause, and the cause is valuable service. Keep money in its proper place. It is a servant and nothing more. Too much emphasis on money reverses the entire picture. You then become the servant and money the master. It's good to have money and the things that money can buy, but it's good too to occasionally make sure that you haven't lost the things that money cannot buy. Personal prosperity means more than wealth. Read this chapter as often as possible. Seal your plans in your mind, then relax. Right now, you may have no idea how the additional income you seek is going to come, or how you are going to save the amount you plan, or how you can possibly arrange for the retirement income you've decided upon. Remember, the means are not important. The only important idea is that you know what you want. Whatever your mind can conceive and believe, you can achieve.